study for the summer has been in the little book of First Peter. Uh, we're focusing on Jesus as our living hope. In fact, in the first couple of verses, it tells us that Jesus is our living hope. And so we're building the whole book around that theme. And Jesus is our living hope. Today we want to talk about when good people suffer. You know of anybody that's suffering right now? How many have noticed in the news that there's a war going on in Ukraine? There's people who are suffering. Suffering. It doesn't take much. All you got to do is just uh, look through the news somewhere. There's a shooting going on somewhere. Uh, Chicago. New York. Perhaps Detroit. Sometimes it even gets closer to home. Suffering. Sometimes you hear in the news of a fire. People lost everything. And they suffer. They suffer. Peter skips the usual question people ask. Here's the question most people ask. Why do good people suffer? But Peter skips right over that. He just skips right over it. And I think perhaps it's because Jesus has already answered it. Why do good people suffer? Listen, there was a certain ruler that asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus stops him right in his tracks and he says, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. There's a problem with the premise of the question, why do good people suffer? And the problem with the question is, there's only one good people and that is God. There are no good people in the absolute sense of the word. That's rough to swallow, isn't it? Most people don't want to swallow that. Wait a second. There's none good except God alone. You see, it wasn't always that way, though. This is the whole point. If you read the first chapter of Genesis, as you wake your way down through the chapter of Genesis, God creates in six days, man. He makes the sun. He makes, he makes the animals. He makes land. He, you go all the way down, and the last thing is he makes mankind in his own image. And, and then the capstone of it all is it says this, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Man was good. Man was good. Not just good. Very good. Isn't that amazing? But you who have read your Bible past chapter 2, got into chapter 3, you realize that God had planted a tree in the midst of the garden and said, hey, of this tree you can't eat, for the day you eat of it you shall surely die. And you know that happened in chapter 2, he plants it. In chapter 3, Eve sees it, she partakes, she offers it to her husband, he partakes. And because of that, the Apostle Paul summarizes it in one verse. He says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. Goodness was gone. Sin had arrived. Amazing. The last phrase, all sinned, is an intentionally in a tense that says everybody sinned at the moment Adam sinned. You see, my original sin is what Adam committed because Adam was the human race. He, uh, he was the embodiment of all mankind, and so when he sinned, he became a sinner, and everyone after him that was born was born in his image as a sinner so that he says, he quotes he quotes David and Paul. They both say this, there is no one who does good, not even one. There's no good people. There's no good people. It's just as Jesus said. No one is good except God alone. You see, when that young ruler came and it was challenging Jesus and he was saying, good master, and Jesus, whoa, oh, whoa. Oh. Do you really know what you're saying? Are you really calling me God? Because only God is good. Only God is good. 
the whole point Jesus is making, the whole point of all this is, Jesus is God come in the flesh. And so Jesus is the only good person since the fall of Adam. Adam was good, and he fell into sin. The only good person since then has been Jesus. Protected by the virgin birth of our Savior, the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary, conceiving within her what the Bible says is a holy thing. The holy thing is Christ. He has a sinless humanity because he's a sinless person, God, in the flesh. He's the only one, the only one. So the question then becomes, why did the only good person suffer? <laughs> that's, a, that's the question. Why did the only good person suffer? And the answer is, as a substitute for you and me. We're going to see in our passage today, he died the righteous for the unrighteous. He took our place. I couldn't die for your sins. <laughs> You've got to die for your own sins. You can't die for my sins. But Jesus could die for my sins and your sins because he's an infinite person. He's good. And he could, as a substitute, take our place. Jesus suffered and died to take our place because the Bible says, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And suffering and death comes upon the world because of our sin. That's why it is. So now I dealt with the why. Peter doesn't deal with the why. He skips right over the why. And he goes right after the fact. He says, listen, good people do suffer. In fact, if you look, I think it's 14th verse. It says, if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Most of us don't look at it that way. <laughs> we, we don't say, come on, give it to me again. <laughs> A little more pain here, a little more affliction, a few more problems. If you should suffer for what is right, not just any suffering, it's when you suffer for right. You see, what is about to happen in the Christian community is all-out persecution. Nero is in power, the emperor, and he is going to make the Christians his scapegoat to destroy Rome and rebuild it, and, and persecution is on its way. And he says, if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. You are blessed. So, when the so-called good people that we're talking about, because we all call them good people, people, saved people, the righteous people, when good people suffer, first thing I do is control yourself, yourself. And by the self, I want to start with your mind. you got to control your mind. Listen to what it says. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Live in harmony with one another. The word harmony, i got highlighted, comes from the, the two Greek words slammed together, and it's homophrones, which means same thinking. It's kind of like this. You have the same thoughts. <laughs> now, that's pretty hard when you got a Christian who's a Democrat or a Christian that's a Republican. <laughs> And then you throw, a, you, you throw an independent in the mix, and, and uh, you got these people. And, and, you know, it comes to why sometimes the harmony exists in this way. We agree to disagree, and we just leave it there. Right? He said, come on, you've got you to come together, and, and you've got to be able to think together. You've you got to be able to think and if you're so angry and outraged because somebody has a different thought than you, you need to learn to agree to disagree and just leave it there. You know, I have friends in the ministry that hold theological doctrines that are different than me. And you know what? We've, we've debated our points, and we finally get to the point where I know I'm not changing your mind, you know you're not changing my mind, and we just agree to disagree, and we go about the ministry of reaching lost people for Jesus because we have harmony, harmony. He says, you know, sometimes when you suffer, you get, you get thinking, poor me, and you get all these different thoughts, and he's saying, no, you've got to have the same mind you come together when you're thinking. 
He says, all of you. Now, when I think of all of you, he's been going through a section where he's talking about citizens uh, being uh, uh, submissive to their government. He's talked about slaves or employees being submissive to their bosses. He's talked about wives and, and their relationship to their husbands. And, and he's just concluded that men are supposed to dwell with their wives in an understanding way. And he says, finally, all of you live in harmony. Husband, wives, you've got to learn to think on the same page. Harmony. Harmony. That's what he's talking about in this passage. Next, he says, you have to be, he says, you need to control your passion, your passion. You can get worked up on some issues. A lot of people do. I mean, have you watched the news lately? People have gone overboard because of a Supreme Court decision that just has said everything goes back to the states. The people are supposed to, through their representative, make laws, not the court. And all they're doing is correcting an error that was made before. And, and, but people are so outraged, they're threatening to take other people's lives. He said, listen, their passions have got hold of them. But here he says, no, you've got to control your passions. He says, be sympathetic. Sum pathes. Two words again. He takes two words in the Greek, slams them together, and it means suffer with the people. Don't inflict the suffering of the people. There are Christians being persecuted around the world. And here we live in cushy America, and we have, don't even have a thought about it. But we should be able to say, you know what? My heart, my heart goes out to those who are suffering for the name of Jesus. He says, be sympathetic. He says, love as brothers. Now, here's another word we know, and it's two words in Greek slammed together, and it is phila and adolfoi. We get the word Philadelphia from it, and it means love as brothers, love as brothers. I told you before about how my, my younger brother, every now and then I would kind of beat him up to put him in his place because he was my younger brother. I'd pound on him. And then one day, a friend of mine thought he could pound on him too, and that was a mistake. I beat the daylights out of this kid for laying hand on my younger brother. I could do that, but he couldn't do that because I love my brother, and I was disciplining him, but you're not going to hit him. <laughs> no way. Love is brothers. Where in the body of Christ, we stand with each other. We love his brothers. We love his brothers. Be compassionate. This is control your feelings, your feelings. You know, when he says all these things like be sympathetic, love, be compassionate, if he's commanding us to do it, it means that we're able to do that. The word compassion comes from two words, usplankna. That's a weird word, splankna. It actually means good bowels. That's kind of weird. Have you, ever, have you ever seen a situation where it disturbed you so much it hurt deep down? You ever been so frightened in a horror movie or in a mystery movie where, where you're just you're feeling anxious deep down inside? That's the idea. It's used for the Good Samaritan. You know the story. The Levite and the priest go by and overlook the, the poor Jewish guy that has been beaten up, but the Samaritan comes by and he sees him, and he has splankna. It hurts him inside that this guy has been beat up on the side, robbed and left to die, and nobody's helping him. It hurts him deep inside. He's not desensitized because he's been watching so many bloody killings on TV. He's not desensitized because he's heard so much foul language and he's just, what do you know, he's the enemy, Samaritan, and that's a Jew, and he's just one of those blankety-blank-blank blank persons. No, he, he's not desensitized. He's got the splunk not deep down inside, and he's moved with compassion. He takes the man, puts him on his donkey, takes him to the, the inn, and he keeps him. He binds up his wounds. He pours in oil and wine, and he gives him medicine, and he tells the innkeeper, listen, i got to go, but when I come back by, if, if there's anything more that he owes, I'll pay it. Powerful, huh? That's what Splunk Nod does. He says, listen, 
In the Christian community, when there's suffering going on, you have got to be compassionate. You can do that. It's a command. Do that so it's there. You can do it. And then he says, be humble. Here again, all these words are two words slammed together. Tapaino franes. It really means humble think. The word humble means low. Think low. Don't think about how big you are, how powerful you are, how great you are. You think low that in the book of Philippians, it says that Jesus, who was God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God. He didn't think he had to siege at God. He was God. But he emptied himself and was made in the form of a man, and he humbled himself and became obedient even unto death, even the death of a cross. He became a servant. He said, humility, think like Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus. He wants us to humble ourselves. He wants you to control your reaction. Here's another one of those double words. He slaps together, apodidomi. And what it means is away from to give. Give it away from or to give back. He says, do not give back evil with evil. Somebody's treating you wrong. You don't reciprocate and give back the same thing they're doing to you. Or insult with insult. This is what he says. Instead, give back a blessing wow, wait, this this guy is making my job miserable. He's intentionally making me do extra work. Or my neighbor is intentionally doing that which pushes my buttons. My kid is actually doing this deliberately to me. (laughs) Repay with blessing. Wow, that's powerful. Because to this end you were called so that you might inherit a blessing. Hang on to that thought. Inherit a blessing. God wants to bless you. God created you to bless you. Genesis chapter 1, the very last verse, God saw everything that he made. It was very good. And he blessed them. And he blessed them. God created us to bless us. He wants you to inherit a blessing. My second point is this. You want to stick with the Bible. When you're suffering, stick with the Bible. Here's the reason. He says, four. Whoever would love life and see good days. Uh, how many would like that? Have a lovely life and see good days. I could say raise your hand and everybody would raise their hand. Yeah, count me in. I want that. He says he must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. Keep his tongue from evil, all right, doing, saying wrong things, and his lips from lying, like cursing and lying. Stay away from those two things, okay? He must turn from evil and do good. Now, there's no one who does good, but you're supposed to turn from evil and do good. It's in the relative sense now, not the absolute sense. Absolutely, I can't do anything good because I'm shot through with sin. I'm just a saved sinner. That's all I am, saved by the grace of God. And it's only because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that I can do any good thing. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith. That is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For you are his, his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. <laughs> He saves us to do good works, not because I'm a good guy, it's because I'm a saved guy, I can now do good works. He says he must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears attend to their prayers. Oh, I like that. He sees me, he hears me. Last week's message from the verse prior to this told husbands, live in your, with your wives in an understanding way so that your prayers will not be hindered. Woo! Here it says, his ears are attentive to their prayers. He hears. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. He says, listen, you... The person who is causing you that suffering and shame and the, the, who, who's 
being such a bear in your life? He says, listen, the Lord is against those who do evil. God will take care of it. God will take care of it. That's the reason. Stick with your Bible. And here comes the big question then. Well, who's going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Who's going to har harm you if you're eager to do good? You're doing a good job, and, and you know who that is. There are people out there who are eager to harm you. Jesus was perfectly good, and you know how he ended up, right? There are evil people out there. He said, but who's going to harm you if you're eager to do good? And here's the answer, but even if you should suffer for what is right, like Jesus, you are blessed. There's our word again. Wow. Most of us don't look at suffering as a blessing. But there is a blessing in there. He says, do not fear what they fear and do not be frightened. And he quotes from Isaiah chapter 8. And the answer to this, you just count your blessings. We quoted the verses the last time from the book of Acts where Peter said, I have to obey God rather than men. But after they had beaten him and, and he reported to the church, he said, uh, he thanks God that he counted me worthy to suffer shame for his name. Wow. When was the last time you said, thank you, God, for this difficulty? You count me worthy to have this in my life. Boy, we, we, we just don't. The, the fourth thing he says here, when the good people suffer, prepare your heart. Prepare your heart. But in your heart, he says, Set apart Christ as Lord. The word set apart is the word holy. That's what, holiness means to set something apart. And in my heart, I set the Lord as holy. I set him apart and, and I say, he is my master, he is my Lord. I set Christ apart as my Lord. So the Lord calls the shots and then I'm obedient to him. And he's saying, in your heart, make sure Christ is on the throne. That's all it is. That he is the king of your life. He's the Lord. He's the master. And you're doing what he wants you to do. He says, always be prepared. I like that. This is the motto of the, the Boy Scouts, right? Be prepared. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. I was just a young teenager. And I was inviting my friends to come to church. My buddies were coming. We had a softball team. You couldn't play unless you went to church. And I got them to get play on the team, so now they had to come to church so they could actually go to the games and, and be in the games. And my buddies were coming, and we had this organization called Christian Service Brigade, and my, my teen buddies were coming with me. And uh, one day after our meeting, the, guy, the leader had given a salvation message in our club meeting, and... Uh, one of the guys, my friend Dennis, he has the same name as mine, Dennis and Dennis, we were double trouble. Think of two Dennis, the menace in the neighborhood. But my friend Dennis says to me, he says, man, can you tell me about this getting saved thing the, that the leader Roy was talking about? And I was stuck in my tracks. I didn't know what to say. I said to him, uh, no, but Roy can tell you. He said, no, 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 I don't want to talk to him, but boy, if you could tell me, I'd listen. And I couldn't tell him. I was not prepared to give the reason of hope that I had inside me. I missed the opportunity. Let me tell you something. That opportunity never, ever came again. I wasn't prepared. Our More to Life series this fall, a little commercial here, is going to be on how you can be prepared to share your faith. Just simple. Everybody's got a unique story. We're going to teach you how to use your story to share it so people will know how they can be saved too. It's going to be so simple. But I want you to memorize those verses. We're doing these verses for a reason. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone 
who ask you to give the reason for the hope that you have. You know what my reason of hope is? Jesus Christ is my living hope. He died on the cross for my sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day and he is alive. He is my Lord and Savior and I have life that he's given me when I called on his name to save me, I have eternal life. I, and that's my hope. That he which began a good work will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I have this hope. I am now prepared. It took me a little work to get prepared. I have so much more in the sermon, but I got to tell you, I probably told you before, after that experience, I, a friend of mine led a buddy to Christ, and I saw how he did it, and I took a Bible and I marked it all up. I went out hunting for someone to share my faith with. And I'm driving down the road and there's a hitchhiker and it's perfect. I don't know this guy. I don't want to do it to a friend I know. I swing over, reach across, open the door, fling it open. I said, hop in if you don't mind riding with a religious fanatic. He hopped in. I looked at him and I know this guy. Oh my goodness. Bill Crane. I know him. He says, well, yeah, what's this religious fanatic stuff? I said, well, you know, I've been going to church. I bailed on my whole plan. It, I mean, that was a, it just threw me off. I, wasn't, I thought wasn't as prepared as I thought. Next day I'm driving along, I see him again, he hops in the car a second time. And, and this time I'm sharing my, sharing my faith with him about, really just about church. And he fi finally I turn to him and I, I get courage up to ask him. And I said, Bill, are you saved? And he said, no, but I'm going to be. Now, I was not expecting that answer. I wasn't. So I said, Bill, when are you going to be? He says, as soon as you tell me how. I pulled my car over. I pulled my Bible out of the back seat where I was prepared. I had all my verses marked. At the end of the one, it told me to go to the next passage, so I knew where I was going next. And I started at Romans 3.23, 6.23, Romans 5.12, and I went to Romans 9, 10, uh, 10, 9 and 10. And, and then I asked him uh, at verse 13, you call on the name of the Lord. Uh, I said, you want to do it right now? Right there in my front seat, he prayed and accepted Jesus as his Savior. You got to be prepared. And that's what the verse is saying. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks. He basically said, tell me. You've been telling me about it. And you, now you want to know if I'm going to be? Well, as soon as you tell me actually how to do it, I'll do it. We have to be prepared how to share our faith when the window of opportunity opens. And so often the window of opportunity opens when there is suffering. I saw a lot of people come to Christ through divorce. They're broken and hurting, suffering. Suffering. They find Christ and find, hey, I, I can have a new life in Christ comes through suffering, suffering. He goes on, he says, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience. Listen, he says, the guy in the end zone with John 3, 16, okay, imagine being at the, a bus stop and somebody grab you by the collar and say, buddy, you're a lost sinner, you're going to hell, you need John 3, 16. That's not a real effective way. You turn more people off. Are they lost sinner going to hell? Do they need Jesus? Yes. But he says, you do this in a gentle and respectful way. And that's why I want to, in the fall when we do our more life study, everybody's got a story to tell and you can tell your story so that it's just personal, comes right from you and, and you're just telling the reason of hope that you have and then you just say, you can have that hope too. <laughs> so beautiful, so beautiful. You do it in a gentle way and he says, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. People will say bad things about your good behavior, goody, goody two-shoes, or whatever they're going to say, you Bible thumper, whatever they're going to say. I had another preacher one time, I had a dueling column in the paper where I wrote an article and he wrote one and, he used to, and I always put the gospel in mind every week and he used to, I knew he was talking about me, he says, you got to be aware of those preachers that all they do is polish the old rugged cross. I think he was talking about me every week. I was telling people how to be saved in my article because it was going out to 40,000 people. Be careful, he says here, hey, there can be people that they're, 
They're going to be malicious towards you, but your good work will make them ashamed of their slander. That's very good. Use your head is my fifth point. Fifth point is this. It's better if it's God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Here's it is. Which is better, God's will or your will? Well, it's God's will. What if it's God's will that you should suffer for doing good? Is that better than your will suffering for doing evil? <laughs> it's just use your head. That's logical. I'm going to stick with God. God works everything together for good to those who love God and are the called according to His purpose, Romans 8.28. And so if it's God's will for me to suffer, to bring about the greater good, shouldn't I rather suffer for Jesus? Finally, I think this is my last, but it's a long point. Trust your Savior. For Christ died for our sins once for all. Jesus didn't suffer many times on the cross, just once. His sacrifice was once, at the end of the age, put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, Hebrews says. The priest every day offered a sacrifice, but he said, no, he appeared once at the end of age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. At one time, he died for all our sins, for all time, for all eternity. He took care of it all on the cross. Christ died for our sins once for all. And then here it is. Remember I told you earlier, it was the righteous for the unrighteous. Why did this good person die? Why did he suffer? He took my place. I was the unrighteous. I'm the one who should have died. But he died in my place to take away my sins, to forgive me, and give me an abundant life. And then when I pass through the portal of death or through the rapture and I'm taken out of this world, I'm going to then forever and ever and ever live in absolute glorified righteousness. Man, to me, that's heaven. That's heaven. Never sinning again, ever, ever, ever again. Listen, Jesus died, took our place to bring us to God, to bring you to God. He's the only way. Jesus said, I'm the only way, the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me, and there is no other way. People who we think are doing really good, they're, good, they're do-gooders, are going to wind up with, without Christ if they don't call upon him to be saved. My good friend, when I had the opportunity, if he's never since then accepted Christ, as good a guy as he may be, is going to spend eternity apart from Christ. It says he was put to death in the body. That was verified by the soldiers that were there. They, they declared that he was dead. He was in the grave for three days. He says, but made alive by the Spirit. You see, Christ is our living hope. He is alive. And that makes it our living hope. Our living hope. Now, it says then next, through whom and the whom's antecedents I understand to be the Spirit. Through the Spirit also he went and he preached to the spirits in prison. Notice he didn't say he went and preached to the spirits in paradise. He went and preached to the spirits in prison. What spirits are in prison that he's talking about? He's saying those who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. So Noah was a preacher of righteousness and he's preaching for like 120 years while he's building the ark. And you know how many converts he had? Zero. Well, he had his family. Mrs. Noah, I don't know her name. Mrs. Japheth, Japheth, Ham, Shem, okay. Eight in all, that's what he goes on to say. Listen, in it only a few people, eight in all, were saved. You know, it's not my job to save people. It's not. It's my job to be faithful to share the message so that Jesus will save people. I am not the Holy Spirit working on the inside. I'm just the mouthpiece being obedient to God. God said, go and preach the gospel. And I, that's all I do. My job is to be faithful to the Lord and obedient and share my faith. It's God's job to change their hearts from the inside so that they respond. Only a few people were saved. You know who were saved? Those that trusted God. 
everyone else perished. Everyone else perished. Now, in it, the ark, only a few people, eight and all, were saved. Through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Very interesting passage here. The ark was like Christ. He is the Savior. Everybody that goes through the door of the ark is saved through the waters. The water was death because everybody in the water perished. But those in the ark, which is Christ, they're saved through all the judgment. And that's what happened. When I accepted Jesus, all my judgment was taken away by Jesus. And so he's saying here, through the water, which symbolized, which is all symbolized by baptism. Now, to make it sure that you don't misunderstand that the rite of baptism saves you, although it sounds like it, he goes on to say, not the removal of the dirt from the body, so not the water stuff. That's just a symbol. But where the real thing takes place, but it's a pledge of a good conscience towards God, it's when you, in your conscience, you declare, Lord, Jesus, to be your Savior, you have this pledge. I pledge my life to you, my faith, my, my trust is in you. That's what does it. And he says, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, not by the baptism. It's only a symbol. It's like this. I try to portray this every time we have a baptism. When I accept Jesus, it's like I died on the cross with Jesus because uh, if any man be in Christ, okay, and... Uh, Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and the life I now live. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So when I died, I died with Jesus and I was buried. And that's what baptism symbolizes. I went into the water, I died. But as Jesus arose from the dead, so did I. I rise with newness of life. It all takes place when I make that good conscience commitment to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. the Savior and Lord, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authority, and powers all in submission to him. The angels, authorities, and powers are designations of, e of spirit beings, and what he is saying is every spirit being is in, a, in submission to him. He has inherited the blessing all through suffering. And if he inherits a blessing through suffering, then we, when we suffer for Jesus, inherit the blessing too. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? That's great stuff. So when the so-called good people suffer, don't ask why. Instead, control yourself, your thoughts, your emotions, your passions. He says, stick with your Bible. All things work together for good. I'm going to stick with the Bible. I'm going to stick with what the Word says. I'm, I'm going to get in my Bible all the more. Things are tough in my life. I'm going to get in the Bible all the more. I'm going to stick with it. Count your blessings somewhere in this. God, I know that you're blessing somewhere in this. Even in the most difficult, terrible times. And, and sometimes I share some of the most difficult, terrible times and with friends who went through the same with me, and we say, you know what? Looking back, those were the good old days. <laughs> those were the good old days. Because we see what came out of it. But when we're in it, we can't see it. Count your blessings, he says. Prepare your heart. You've got to prepare your heart. That I'm going to honor Jesus no matter what. Whatever what life dishes to me, man, I'm going I'm to set Jesus on the throne in my life and I'm going to honor him and use your head. I'd rather suffer doing God's will than suffer for not doing God's will. So I'm going to do God's will no matter what happens and trust your Savior. Trust Him. Trust Him. I don't care if the stars fall from the sky. Trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. Hey, let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for this book of uh, Peter, who, the disciple of Jesus, who had blown it in his own life, and he suffered, Lord, and he's instructing us when, it's, when sufferings come, 
and put our trust in real hope, the living hope, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that someone here today who might be suffering, you might have spoke to their heart. You might have said, you know what? You need to be in the Bible and just hang on to the Word or some other point just to be prepared for what's coming. But they've grabbed hold of that, Lord. I pray that today it'll carry them through. That they will set Jesus Christ apart in their heart as Lord. Should someone here not know Jesus today, they would just say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know that. There's no good. I'm, I'm one of those no-gooders. Jesus is good. I accept his sacrifice for me. Right now, I'm calling on you to save me, Say, Lord, save me. Father in heaven, I know you will. You will because you have promised to do so. You cannot lie when it comes to things of our eternal salvation. Your word says so. May we draw comfort and strength today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.